Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, for those of you that earlier said that you'd like an, an aquarium, please see me at the drinks and I can explain to you why you don't. Um, they're very expensive. And for those of you that don't have a historic ship, listen in, because I've got one just for you. Um, so I am, um, I am the director of National Museums Liverpool. We run uh, seven museums, including the Maritime Museum and the International Slavery Museum, already going with that international name, if we're classing that as a Maritime Museum. Um, and within our collection, we have three historic ships. Uh, the first one is the Bottle Bank, uh, which is a tug that you can see over um, on the far side that is still in the water, um, thanks to our volunteers who do an incredible job to keep it in the water uh, on an annual basis. And it tours around, you can normally find it outside the Maritime Museum in Liverpool. In the middle, uh, we have the Edmund Gardner, which is a pilot ship, uh, it's in dry dock. For a, for a period of time, it looked like this, uh, when we dazzled it uh, as part of an arts project for the biennial. But I know that offends some of you in the room, so we'll go back to how it looks today. Um, so it is back to its original, uh, its original colours. Um, and the Edmund Gardner is a pilot ship operated in Liverpool, very strong connection um, to the city. And the, the third ship that we have in the black and white photo there is De Wadden. Uh, De Wadden is a Dutch mast schooner um, and has been in our collection since the 80s. Um, and is the reason I'm here today. <laughs> so um, here at National, uh, National Museums Liverpool, we are in the middle of a major um, regeneration project. So I love this photo of Liverpool's waterfront. You can see um, all of our museum sites down on the waterfront, as well as Royal Albert Dock and the Three Graces, the Liver Beds and others. But what, what we're planning to do in Liverpool is to completely redevelop the International Slavery Museum and the Maritime Museum that are both within, currently within the same building. And our plan is to give the International Slavery Museum its own front door and to link it across and to provide better space um, for both museums to operate separately, but also to tell those combined stories together. We also want to use the outdoor space of the museum. We're a museum based on our waterfront. Liverpool is a city built on transatlantic slavery. Um, that history is all around us, and we want to use that outdoor space as well as the indoor space to tell the story of Liverpool as a city. And it's a project that's been in development for quite a long time, and we've been talking about it for quite a long time, but we're now at the point where we've appointed designers and architects, and we've done some fundraising, we've got some money in the bank, and we're moving forward with this project. So it's a, it's a 70, 75 million pound project, I feel like it goes up every time I look at my team, um, but I'm hoping that it's not going much beyond 75 million. Um, and about 57 million of that is on the museum developments. So it is on the redevelopment of the International Slavery Museum and the Maritime Museum. And as part of that project, we had to do a lot of, a, a lot of work and a lot of soul searching about what were the stories we really wanted to tell in our new museums. And we're still working that through with our communities and with partners. But a big part of that became the story about the ships and what are we going to do with the ships. Um, this photo here shows you a look across to our dry docks, the Cannon Graven docks. You can't really see in the photo, but um, Edmund Gardner is in the background there, dazzled. So if you can see any bright colours, that is the Edmund Gardner. But what's more telling here is De Wadden is in one of those dry docks, but has no real presence on the landscape of Liverpool as you look across those docks. You can just about make out the three masts of De Wadden, um, but other than that, she, she sadly doesn't have a great presence uh, in that space. And she was originally purchased in the 80s, as I said, when the Maritime Museum was being developed. So as we were developing the Maritime Museum, um, colleagues who many of you will have known bought these vessels in, a, in an attempt to kind of build up the museum collection and talk about the stories they wanted to tell. The reason for purchasing De Wadden was very clearly that there was a plan to bring the, bring the vessel in and then set up a project to work with young people and to develop skills to, um, to conserve her back to 
original sailing um, condition. And then to be able to use her over time to teach skills to people and to maintain our shipbuilding skills as we go across. And that was the reason that she was purchased. This picture shows her sailing in past the liver birds into Liverpool. Um, and, and on this picture, it was a great idea and, and absolutely I understand why she was purchased for the collection. She cost us £20,000 at the time. Um, but shortly after she came in, very shortly after she came into Liverpool, we discovered that really she wasn't in a very great condition to stay in the water. And she immediately started sinking in the water. And so fairly quickly we dry docked her. And today, the warden looks a bit sadder <laughs> and looks like this. Um, and this is how she's looked for 40 years in Liverpool. Um, she's been in those dry docks. We've done bits of work on her over the time, but not a huge amount. And the project to develop skills and to work with young people and to do all the stuff that was intended has never been realized. So there was, it's never been realized. And in truth, is never going to be realized. It's just not what we do. Um, we have some shipbuilders within our team, within our conservation team, but they're not a very big team, and we w we're not looking to develop that kind of project at this moment in time. So when I joined the museum, there was a lot of conversation about these dry docks. Now, these dry docks are right in the city centre in Liverpool. They're in the middle of the biggest tourism area for the city. Um, Millions and millions of people pass through this area every single day. And for quite a long time, it was fenced off. So not only was De Wadden looking quite sad there, you couldn't get any very close to her anyway because it was fenced off. These docks were built originally for the, for the cleaning and maintenance of slaving vessels. They are, and then they have been used through Liverpool's history and through time. Um, through its port history and people in the city still have living memory of these being working dry docks. They are probably one of the most important architectural features in the city in terms of telling the city's history. Um, and we want to be able to use them in a different way. And so we had to have a conversation that said, okay, what are we going to do with the Wadham? And my, my shipkeeping team came to me and we sat... We went, onto, we went onto the vessel, we had a look around. There's a lot of holes, really. There's a lot of daylight when you're in the hull. Um, and we, we got, we were stood on the quay side and we were like, well, what are the options? And my ship, one of my shipkeepers said to me, well, either we need to invest significant amounts of money, so a couple of million into her now, and then commit probably half a million a year forever to maintain her and, you know, keep." restore her and do all of that or we need to dispose of her and I said well we need to dispose of her then now I'm not totally convinced that was the answer he was looking for I think he was hopeful of the former however it just wasn't where we are and, and Ian our, our head of the Maritime Museum is in the room somewhere um, over here um, I think Ian would agree with me. We had the conversation with the curators and we were like, well, of the three ships that we have and of the limited resources we have, the other two are more important to us in terms of telling the story of Liverpool as a port and how the city developed and all of those kind of things than De Wadden is. De Wadden, um, originally, as I said, Dutch schooner, originally sailed between um, the Netherlands and Ireland. It would trade then between Ireland and Liverpool. So it does have a Liverpool connection. If anybody from the Netherlands or Ireland would like her, very welcome. We're currently in that process. Um, so there, there is a connection, but that, that connection is the story of trade. And in truth, we believe there's a better way of telling that story of trade that's more cost effective in terms of use of public money. And so we took the very difficult decision that we were going to go through a process of disposal um, and de deaccessioning. Now, I don't know about any other parts of the world, but in the UK, we talk a lot about disposal in the museum sector as it being a very positive thing. It's very positive. Museums should dispose. It's a healthy way of caring for your collection. Of course you should do it. We don't actually do it. 
because that's all a bit scary and we don't really understand what we're doing there and nobody wants to do that. So we talk about it a lot as it being a really great thing to do, but in truth, when it comes to it, we don't really do. And that's slightly what we've done with the warden. She was slightly out of sight and out of mind. Um, she's, a, uh, she's metal and therefore not rotting. Um, and therefore kind of in the dry dock, not causing us too much hassle really, other than when we get to a point where we're saying, well actually, we want to use these dry docks differently and we want to do something different and we want to interpret this space differently. Um, and so we, we talked about what would that look like then uh, in terms of disposal. And of course, disposal has numerous different outcomes. Um, we are still very hopeful that someone, maybe someone in this room, may say, actually, we'd really like to warden. In which case, let's have a conversation. <laughs> Marvellous. Um, and that maybe, you know, maybe she could go on to a new home and, and be restored and, and, and live the life that we intended for her. But realistically, she's not in a great state. She'd be very, very expensive to restore. And we knew the moment we started a process of disposal, we have to be realistic to the fact that that may end up in deconstruction. Um, and that's where it got really scary for us in National Museums Liverpool, because if we get, and we're not there yet, but if we get to a point of deconstruction, the only way to do that would be to do it in situ in this dry dock, which, as I said, is right in the middle of the city center. And the public have a very strong view about museums and they believe that when, they, when we have objects, we have them for life. And so the thought of us soaring up one of our biggest objects in the city center over probably a three to six month period absolutely terrifies my comms team, who um, originally said to me, if we get to that point, can we put a tent over her? And I said, so it looks like a murder scene? And they said, oh yeah, okay, let's not do that. So we know that that's maybe where we will end up. Um, but actually, what I really wanted to talk about was how positive us taking that decision has been um, and how positive it's been for the stories we tell and our connections and actually for how we how we preserve the story of Dewadham. So we went public with um, deaccessioning and we, we tweeted it out and the Museums Association in the UK tweeted it and our local paper ran this very helpful story um, that was fairly sensationalist. Um, but they ran that story as well, which we kind of expected. And we kind of sat and waited to see what was gonna happen next. And in truth, sadly, for a long time, very little happened next. Um, there was a bit of noise on social media, but not negative. Um, there was various people just commenting on what Dewadden was um, and talking about her and the fact that we were looking at, at disposal. Um, so there was a bit of that for a bit. Um, and there was various other stories with people asking um, what, what was the plan, what was their history. Even, even the comments page in our local paper, which I generally never read because it's not normally a positive place to be, um, wasn't particularly negative about a museum getting rid of an object, which is what we expected. Um, what was more interesting was where we did get particular comments, it was generally from people within the sector saying things like this, where they were saying, well, this is quite interesting. I'll be interested to see what happens next. Um, and there was a lot of people kind of saying, well, how's this gonna work and what will that look like? Of the emails we have had, and we're still open to emails and suggestions and of the emails we've had, the vast majority of them have been from the museum sector and have been from other museums saying, 
we've got a ship that maybe we need to dispose of. Can we speak to you about how you've done the process? Um, we have had a couple of offers. I think I'm right in saying three offers, but only two still on the table. Yeah. So we've had three interested parties. Um, the first, at the point at which we shared the um, condition report, decided they weren't that interested anymore. Um, I'm imagining the other two will probably go the same way, in all honesty. But we have had some interest, but not realistic interest, if I'm honest. Um, but most of the interest has been from the sector saying, actually, this is a challenge. The other interest that we have had has been from our local maritime community. And this was the, the area that we were maybe most concerned about. What would be the reaction of our voluntary local maritime community? Would they, would they be up in arms at the idea of us, of us disposing of one of our historic ships? Uh, uh, and all three of our ships are on the historic ships register. You know, we're not under, I'm not undervaluing the historic value that all three of them have. Um, and I received uh, one email from uh, a lady who uh, used to be the chair of our Maritime Museum Friends. And for anybody who knows the story of the Maritime Museum Friends in Liverpool, it didn't end well. Um, before my time, <laughs> but she emailed me and the email said, Dear Laura, um, I think you would value from my, from my knowledge and expertise on this issue, regards. And I thought, would I? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I arranged to meet with her and um, we met with her. And I, I was fully expecting a kind of, you can't do this for whatever reason. And um, her first question was, what are you doing with Edmund Gardner, our pilot vessel? And we said, Edmund Gardner remains a really important part of our collection. And actually, the point around disposing of the warden is to ensure that we've got the resources to properly care for Edmund Gardner and to ensure that when Brottle Bank, and, and to keep Brottle Bank in the water for as long as possible to do that, but ensuring also that if it comes to a point when Brottle Bank can no longer be in the water, we have a space within our dry dock for Brottle Bank to remain in our collection. Those two vessels are part of our long-term future. We absolutely are committed to them. And she said, great, you should never have bought to Wadden. And I said, well, I understand why to Wadden was bought. I, I absolutely get it. But our times have changed, uh, and it's no longer right for De Wadden to be in our collection. It doesn't help with the stories we're trying to tell anymore. So I think um, she was actually really positive and has since put us in touch with various other people. And what going public with our disposals done, and we're a long way off disposing of De Wadden, um, I think we are due to issue notice to deconstruct in the next month or so, and then that's a two, three month process. You know, we're a long way off. If people are interested, we're still interested in that conversation. But, but by having the conversation and being brave enough to say, this isn't the right way to sell our story in truth, and we need to care for these other vessels, and resource is finite, and you know, there's only so much money, and our priority is the other two. It's actually allowed us to rebuild relationships with the maritime community locally. It's allowed us to have very positive conversations with the sector in the UK and beyond. Um, and it's allowed us to explore actually what is really the story we want to tell and what are the better ways of showing it. We've had some really great conversations with um, our local university who are really keen to help us with some um, photographs and, and, and help with the deconstruction and how that would be and how we'd record that which would be very positive. We, we've talked about what parts of the vessel might we keep in the collection, um, but it's allowed us to start a conversation about this space and our collection and the stories we really want to tell in our museum. And therefore, on the whole, as terrified as I was, and still am, if I'm honest, the idea of soaring up to Wadden in our dry dock still wakes me up in cold sweats of a night. But actually, I truly believe it's the right thing for us to do. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you. Um, there are people here you should talk to. I think Jonathan Bolver would be one person. But do you remember a conference in um, uh, Esbjerg when we heard uh, Nat uh, Howe talk about the deconstruction of the Vivona, a project they did? And, and it, it turned out to be quite a positive experience for the community as well. So he's a good good person to talk about the deconstruction project. Thank you so much for your talk. I think it's really interesting to when, that the way you lift uh, issues to the table, challenges that we are facing, because ships are difficult and, and de, uh, deconstructing is, is even more difficult and, and even just uh, getting rid of objects from your collection is challenging. So I'm sure there are lots of questions here. Um, and although it's time for coffee, I think that we should have some questions. We have one there, David, and then Vincent as well, at least. Yeah, hello there. Um, I appreciate your plight. Um, up until 1996, I worked at the Welsh Industrial Maritime Museum in Cardiff. We had a steam tug there. We had Cardiff the Bay D Development Corporation treading on our necks, um, wanting us off the site. And um, this steam tug was, as you say, cut up in public and the South Wales Echo published a photograph every night. So you Thank do you. need to get your PR in place. Um, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, we, we understand the challenge. We understand the challenge of the, the impact that has on public trust in museums. Um, uh, but I remain, I, I, would, I would reiterate my points. Good museums dispose. And that's the argument we'll try and win. Hi, Laura. Vincent hey. from the New Zealand Maritime Museum. Um, just to start, I've never related to a talk more in my life. <laughs> um, and I'm, we recently broke up a major floating steam crane as well, so I'd love to swap war stories. But I'm going to make this a question. Um, my big challenge was, uh, I'm not sure what your museum's governance arrangements were, but our big challenge was with our board. Um, deconstruction costs a lot of money as well. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of frozen with indecision. They couldn't move forward to restore and they couldn't move back to deconstruct um, because both were a huge cost and they couldn't see past that. So I'm just wondering what your conversations have been with whatever your governance uh, team is, whether it's through the council or whether you have your own board, I'm not sure. No, it's a board. Um, so we're nationally funded um, and we have a board and then we're an arm's length body of government as well. Um, the conversation with our board has actually been really positive. Members of our trustee boards have been part of a working committee that we've had for the last six months now, working on all of the issues around Warden and how we get there. Um, the decision of the board, we presented a paper to the board back in uh, March or June, I can't remember which. Uh, the finances are quite stark on this one. Our options really are, um, if we are to keep her, we would have to move her into the other dock, so she would have to move into the into the second dry dock because our plans that we have funding for are to develop one of the dry docks for a different use. To move her and to maintain her to a point where she would be safe enough to move and it by no way in no way conserved, but but just safe enough to move and look half decent, for want of a better phrase, we reckon will cost us somewhere in the region of two and a half million. Um, to dispose, we think, will cost us in the region of half a million. The maths on that was quite clear from our board's point of view. And then we obviously want to spend some more money on uh, telling the story in a different way and interpreting that within the museum. It was still more cost effective. It would still be more cost effective to dispose than it would be to keep her. And so the board have actually been quite supportive of it. The interesting bit will come because we're at arm's length body of government. Um, at the moment... Our national, my national government colleagues are telling me that ministers have no concerns and it's all fine. It depends who our minister is at the point at which we start disposal. That could blow up within, you know, it could. Um, but, but the board are absolutely bought into where we are. Thank you. Okay, one, one final question we have here, I think. Laura, I, th I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I think it's so true, um, certainly on, in, in the area where I am, and Hannah will understand it, we look at enviously over at uh, Hamburg and what's going on with Peking, where they've got all the money in the world. And then we look at the um, other Clyde-built um, bark that's still around in Honolulu, which is a big warning. Do you think there's any value in actually keeping um, your ship 
there as a warning to others and saying, if you don't fund this, that's what's going to happen. I think that's maybe what my predecessor was doing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, th I think it's more, po I think we have to move forward more positively and we want to be able to use what is a very important space in the city centre to tell the story that's really important. And the warden isn't doing that currently. And so I think, I, I think kicking it into the long grass would have been the easy option. And that's what we've done for 40 years. I think now is probably the time for us to make a decision. Thank you. Thank you so much for a uh, really interesting and thought-provoking talk. Uh, and that's the end of this morning's session, and it's time for coffee. And then we will back here at half past 11, right? Yes. Okay, thank you.